<laughs> Professor Agan fell over when the light came on. Uh, welcome to the class. It is a little intimidating. Y'all are looking at me like, oh my God, his ears are turning red. Uh, they are, but I'm not. I'm okay. Um, I'm okay. Um, what were we talking about? Yeah, so what we want to do today, what I'd like to do, is uh, I may call a roll a little bit because I have this joke I want to tell you to kind of start out. And I have to call roll to get there. Um, and you'll see. And, uh, and, and also I want you to, uh, so, the, so the people on TV watching out there will know kind of who we are and how weird and strange we are like they are out there too. Uh, somebody's saying, honey, can we sell these tapes back? <laughs> this guy said we were weird. Um, but among the things I want to do, we have three presentations on the three articles that were due to be read today. Or uh, half of you, A through L, have written on Triandis' article. And, uh, and we'll discuss these, these things in class today. And we'll kind of see how that goes. It's a lot more livelier in a, in a class that we don't have a TV thing. Because all of you guys have to be willing to push the button. Do you like somebody next to you pushing it? You don't? You like holding it down yourself? Okay. Uh, we, we have these mic things that you have to push down. And, uh, and then I want us to present some material that will be good test material and I think will be edifying for this topic, the subject of uh, cultural psychology, which has many uh, ways to, to go with it. So let me just call, <coughs> voice is changing, uh, let me call roll a little bit and, uh, to see, uh, uh, Dao, Deo, Deo, and, and tell me, and get ready, when I call your name, push your button, <laughs> so to speak, it's a kinky class. Push your button and uh, tell me your uh, ethnicity. I guess your race or ethnicity, how you would see your, your race, really. I guess how you, what's the combination of that? And then uh, what's your favorite ice cream is? Are you ready? Both Dale? my parents were born and raised in Nigeria, and I like vanilla. And I like vanilla. And that, that, that ought to be a song. So parents from Nigeria, and I like vanilla. Okay. Um, uh, and uh, Joshua Aldridge, Josh, we got to push the button. Uh, I'm Caucasian. I got a little bit Indian in me, and I like strawberry. Well, what what kind of Indian? Go ahead, push the button. Caddo, it's a Texas tribe. Yeah, Caddo, Lake Caddo. That's great. Okay, and uh, Hus Husna, is that right? Yes. Husna, wait, let me do it. Ali. Husna Ali. Yeah. Yeah. You got the button down? Yep. Um, Indian, I guess. Yeah. My parents are from India. Not the same India that Josh is no, from. No, no, Not like Caddo. India, India. Like, Kata, Caddo. Yeah. And your parents are from northern India, southern like India? middle India. Like, middle India? Yeah. And what's your favorite ice cream? Vanilla. Vanilla, that's great. If y'all get the correct name of ice cream, you'll get uh, an extra prize. Uh, Sonia uh, Ali. Sonia? She's not here. She's out getting ice cream for today. Okay. And uh, Shaba? Shaba Bahidza? Saba. Saba? Yeah. Put I was a, born I put in Iran. You're from Iran? Yeah. Okay. And I like uh, chocolate chip cookie dough. Ooh. Are, are you, do you know the area where the, uh, the loss of the 30,000 people, the earthquake? Do you earthquake? know that area? I heard about it. It was in, it was in Bam. In Bam, yeah. Is that in the mountains or something? It's like, it's a, it's a, it's a small town, all made of like dirt and stuff. So right. when the when the uh, earthquake happened, all the buildings and everything, all the little homes right. fell because it was all. Are you still holding it down? Yes, Good sir. Good job. See, we're risking spontaneity here. <laughs> okay. Uh, 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 thanks. And Sharon Benson. Um, I'm part white and Hispanic, and I like. Part it. white. Yeah. What's what's that? American. <laughs> Do what? American. Yeah, but is that like Irish oh, or Scottish? German, or? maybe. Hmm. I'm not too sure. Yeah, because if you said I'm really a North American, what would your heritage? What, what would your if your race was North American? What would it be? Probably Native American, wouldn't it? So, uh, so, so German, you don't really know. I think so. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and your ice cream was Rocky Road. Rocky Road and uh, Vima, Vimal, Bat, Bakta. He's in California? Well, maybe he's watching on TV. <laughs> he's not here anymore, is he? And uh, Shidza? 
but Diwala? Is that it? Shidza? Uh, Shazad. Say it one more time. Shazad. Shazaz? Yeah. Okay, Shazad. Okay. What does it mean? Uh, it means prince. Shazada means prince. Wow. Go ahead and where, where you're from and what's um, your ethnicity? India. Your Say it again. India. Both my parents are from India. Yes. And your ice cream? Strawberry cheesecake. Ooh. Put on some weight. Uh, Staley, Bryles. Staley. And uh, let's see. And Annie, Boo. Hi. Yeah, hi, you want to hold a little deal down? <laughs> Not all of us are extroverted. <laughs> okay, Annie, what, what, uh, what's your ethnicity or background? I'm Vietnamese. Vietnamese? Yeah. Uh -huh. And did your folks, when did they come here? Um, after the war. Like 75 or later? I don't know. Sure. You don't know? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah. You don't know how they got here? Did they have to pay their way out? Did they? Um, all I know is that they went with the whole group and they went to refugee camps and they flew over here after that. Oh, wow. And what's your favorite ice cream? Cookies and cream. Yeah, that always <laughs> looks like a... Well, it, it's an interesting look, isn't it? If you've ever had a child that's been sick, well, my, uh, Cookies and Cream has it. <laughs> are, are you with me, kind of? It looks like it's already been masticated, chewed on a bit. But enjoy your next batch you have. You'll like it. Okay, and Rochelle uh, B Bush? Rochelle? Rachel Bush. Rachel? Yes. I'm African-American, and my favorite ice cream is butter pecan. Butter pecan. Okay, and Pablo... Yeah, Cardoza. Um, Push the button. Okay. Um, my background is Hispanic, and like, I, what does that mean? Hispanic. Well, uh, hold the button. Keep holding the button. <laughs> Actually, you can well, lean over and touch it. Hold okay. the button. No, he can. She can do it for you okay. while you talk. Well, yeah. Specifically, my mother's from Peru. Right. She, uh, she was born up in the mountains there. She's like four eleven, dark. Didn't speak Spanish as her first language. She spoke a language called Quechua. But Which is an, an Indian Peruvian language? Yeah, it's some kind of dialect that incorporates probably an older language in Spanish. Um, I don't know much about it because she came over here as an orphan, you know, uh, at age like 15 or something or other. So there's no extended family to like really provide the cultural stuff. Um, so I don't know anything about Peru. My real father is he's a like, Chicano, like from California. Okay. You know, spoke spoke. English, but also spoke Spanish, had olive complexion, but I don't really know him, so. Oh, wow. There's a, you know, I pretty much grew up in Houston. Yeah, and great, great. That's it. Well, did you, uh, he, uh, well, you don't talk that much, but, but did you hear everything he said? Like he says Hispanic, well, what does that mean? See, that, that's just a huge generic term. And then he said Chicano? Yeah, my step, my, my real father was uh, Chicano. Right. Well, and see. Pretty much just American, because I don't have to Okay, and we'll, we'll see uh, uh, in, the, in the classes to come how his, some people like to be called Mexican, Mexican-American, Chicano, Latino, Hispanic, and these, all these terms, uh, in one sense, they don't mean anything when you throw them out until you define it a little bit. And uh, uh, your Peruvian culture, uh, that, that, that'll be something in midlife, I bet you'll go search out and find out who those people are. Yeah, I'm, I'm interested, but at the same time, I realize that I'm pretty alienated from Right, right. There. Right, right. Life, so. Yeah, he needs to, she can't hear you, anything you're saying. So, uh, you don't have to say it again. But you see, what I want you all to do as a group is when he just starts talking spontaneously, it's your job to lean over and push it down. Uh, you see what I'm saying? We're going to be a family. We're going to be a dysfunctional family, <laughs> but we are going to be a family. So if somebody starts talking spontaneously, you know, just let them have their say and just reach over and hold it down. Because, you know, are you with me? Some of us can't chew bubblegum and walk at the same time. So we need a little help. And, and, uh, and if they slap your hand for holding it down, well, then don't hold it anymore. Because we, you're not forced to say anything if you don't want to. But, but to do that, it would help. Well, thank you. Thanks for sharing that, too. That's a, um, see, here it is. Everyone, each person's story is everybody's story. And this is what this class is about, is all of us are uniquely different, but all of us are fundamentally just the same. Y'all have mothers, fathers, 
come from groups of people. We all have want and need the same kind of thing. We need to eat. We just ate. This class is at 1 o'clock, hopefully. Uh, you know, we have to sleep. Some of us don't too much. Uh, some more than others. We have basically fundamental things that all human beings are like. And when we come to honor that, uh, then we can celebrate the differences. But we usually freak out over the differences uh, when they, in fact, the differences are the things that are going to enrich our lives, not only in others but in ourselves. Let me do a few more of these and then uh, I have something very important to share with you. If you believe that. Okay, Stephanie Chow. Hi. Hi. <laughs> I'm Chinese. You're Chinese? Yeah, and I like um, mint chocolate chip. Mint chocolate chip. What part of China are you from? Are you from no, China? From Were you born in China? No, I was born here, but my parents are from Taiwan. Oh, from Taiwan? And have you seen Joy Luck Club? Mm -mm. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, you, you will, you will really love it. We're going to see it, and it's a great, great uh, book by Amy Tan and uh, the film. And those of you on the TV out there watching this uh, on tape, you won't be able to see it in the class, but I encourage you to go watch it when we talk uh, about the Asian. Uh, go rent it or something like that. I, I get a cool 20% of your renting it at Blockbuster, so I appreciate you doing that. They're going, honey, this guy gets... No. Okay, uh, but we're going to look at it in the class. We're going to have two days and look at it. Uh, li uh, Lily... Hi, Lily. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Vietnamese, and I also like mint chip. Chocolate mint? Mm hmm Chocolate mint chip. Thank you. Uh, a couple of more. Uh, Andy, of course, Chapman. Uh, I'm Caucasian, and I like Rocky Road. That also sounds like a rock song, doesn't it? Well, maybe it doesn't. Clarence Davis, we have two of y'all. Who is Davis? Caucasian, I like Neapolitan. Neapolitan. Where does Caucasian come from? Does anybody know? Where are the Caucasus Mountains? Anybody know where that is? Has anybody heard of the Caucasus Mountains? Does anybody care about the Caucasus Mountains? <laughs> that would be an interesting uh, little write-up for extra credit. Is uh, Do what? Are they from Greece? I don't think so. I think they're... Uh, <laughs> but I, I like the effort, though, uh, Dale. That, that's that's uh, just kind of stuck it at Greece. And... Uh, I like the risk taking. I think that's good. It's, you're wrong. You're wrong, and uh, we'll we'll get a D for the day. But uh, but yeah, that was good. Um, no, but see, that'd be a good extra credit for all the honky whiteies in here who say, "Well, I'm Caucasian." I go, "Well, what the heck is a Caucasian? What is that? Where, where did that name come from? Are you Anglo-Saxon, German? Are you? Uh, in fact, do, do you know what uh, Andy? Your background? Did your parents come from? Uh, they came from Russia and Germany. Yeah, see, so that takes us a little further back into your uh, culture and stuff. And how about you, Clarence? English. English? Okay. Well, I had a little fit there, didn't I? Uh, okay, uh, and Kareem? I'm mixed with a Cambodian, Persian, and Italian, and my favorite ice cream is vanilla. Cambodian? Persian and Italian. Isn't that fascinating? I'd, I'd like to sit down and have coffee with you and sort of find out how all that happened. But, uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> not, not to get personal. Nah. Y'all are, are pretty sick. Do what? What did you say? Can you see his face? Yeah. That, that's in your favorite ice cream? Is like vanilla. <laughs> vanilla? Yeah. That's great. Uh, and Vanessa? Is it Gouldburn? Vanessa? She's not here. And as, as we get going, I'm, I'm just calling your last names, but when I call roll, <laughs> those watching out uh, on the tapes, we won't do this all the time, but occasionally we'll do it because it's fun and spontaneous and a chance to think about when you're passing somebody, when you're walking in the mall, wherever you are, that. It's just not a, a face, it's a person, it has a history, it has a story, it has a sacred unfolding myth. And uh, 150 years from now, there'll be a group of people that'll be sitting around, probably looking at some sort of a screen, and they'll be scrolling through uh, ancestral pictures of people. Uh, both my parents uh, passed away. My father died when I was 29, my mother when I was 45, which was 12 years ago. And then... Uh, 
as my brother and sister and I were dividing up their, their property, uh, they had about five boxes full of family pictures and, uh, uh, you know, uh, pictures really, and, and articles and old wedding um, uh, certificates, uh, wedding ceremonies officially stamped, you know, all this stuff. Back, in fact, one of them was back at uh, 1861, my great grandparents. And my brother and sister said, uh, hey, uh, Herb, you're into this kind of stuff. Do you want these boxes? And I went, yeah, you guys take the china cabinet. I want the boxes. Uh, you can have the property. I want these memories. And so I have uh, spent a lot of time just, they, they say you don't really become an adult till both your parents die. And I'm not sure that's necessarily true, but I understand the feeling of that. As long as we have parents, we sort of have this buffer, you know, mommy and daddy to go home to. If, if we lost everything, we'd have somebody to take care of us, a, a womb to return, a room to return, a place. And, and, and many of us never really grow up because we still live under the fantasy a mommy and daddy will take care of us and help us and rescue us and save us. And, uh, and when they're gone, you suddenly there's nobody between you and the Grim Reaper, as it were. This is a weird thing to be talking to 20-something-year-olds about death. Uh, but, but, but anyway, at that point in my life, at 45, after both my parents passed, uh, uh, there's some transition that changes. And it had been changing for years where suddenly I, you know, I find that the whole world is full of my mother and father. The whole world is full of my brothers and sisters. Uh, and that there's a bigger community than little family knit. That, that blood is not necessarily what makes you close. It's love that makes you close. Because you can have blood ties and not have any love. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah, I see. Okay, but, but, you can also, but you can have love ties and have no blood ties. And, uh, and those people, as my black friends would say, become blood. The street term, they're blood. I mean, they, they'll do anything for you. Yeah, right, right. Uh, gangs provide that for people. An identity. That's good. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's, a, it's a message to parents to say, What's going on with your family such that they feel people feel closer to these their peers than to you, and that's a usually difficult thing for parents to look at. And I, uh, my two kids, former kids, are 27 and 31, uh, young adults, and uh, you know I just never wanted to give in. Uh, not that the peer pr they, peer pressure and, and peer relationships are essential for developing identity, but I didn't want to become so out of touch with my kids as teenagers that they didn't think I got it or that I understood. And many uh, parents not having worked through their own issues from their own childhood have not, don't know how to raise their uh, teenagers through and give over to, to gangs per se. A couple more of these and we'll move on. Uh, Kelly Green. Is Kelly here? I'm Irish. Yeah? Both my parents are from Ireland. And my favorite ice cream is strawberry. Wow. And, and were, you, were you born here or in Ireland? I was born here by like three months, and then we went back to live because my parents have dual citizenship and they wanted me to have American citizenship first, and so I was born here. And then wow. we went back and lived in Ireland until I was six, and then came back here. And have you seen In America, the movie? No. You must go see it this weekend. Don't pass go. Don't collect $200. Go straight to see In America. It's about an Irish family that came over, and uh, the, the writer, producer, you know, he's... Uh, uh, it's about his family. It's his story of his deal. But it's really good. Does anybody uh, know what I'm talking about? The movie In America? Great movie for uh, to write up for cultural psychology. And uh, we'll look at some of the issues in their lives. Uh, but, but, you know, for extra credit that we've talked about, and those of you watching on uh, tape, uh, I'm sure no matter how long it is from now that you're watching, you can still go rent it. But In America is a great, great movie about uh, cultural... Um, displacement and adjusting to a new culture. Okay, a uh, couple of more. Your favorite ice cream was Rocky Road? Strawberry. And uh, Ro Roquinsha? Ro Say it again. Roquinshanta Hamilton. I'm African American. And what does Roquinsha mean? Roquinshanta. Um, it's like true, divine. Oh, I'm, see, see, I cut off your name when I made that copy. It's Roquin Shanta? Roquin Shanta. I go by Rhoda. Rhoda. Thank God yeah. you go by Rhoda. <laughs> <laughs> How could I do all that? But Roquin Shanta means 
true and divine. True and divine. Mm -hmm. Wow. And I'm African American. Yes. And my favorite ice cream is banana pudding. Wow, that's great. That's good. Um, well, see, the, the answer to this, we need to move on. But thank you all for sharing that. And uh, the reason I do that, and from time to time, I'm going to call roll a little bit of the roll, because I want you to hear, did you see how different we are? But what did we all have in common? Everybody likes ice cream. Now, there's somebody in here who say, well, I don't eat ice cream. And that's fine. You're weird, but uh, uh, it's okay. No, it's okay not to eat ice cream. But you see, we discovered it in just a little, not to, you can kill the metaphor if you are too obvious about it. But, uh, but, but you see how different we are, and yet we're all the same. We all like ice cream. And, yeah, Pablo? It was saying that uh, biology isn't uh, that good at telling convincing people that race is, is unimportant, but right. I think right now that's what it's doing. If we all like ice cream, it's because we all like sweets and sugars because that's something that's biological. You know, it's like something that's uh, set up so that we get those um, particular nutrients in our body. Right. So that's biology telling us that we're all alike in yeah, a way that uh, yeah, so transcends it, race. Yeah, there's a, somebody said there's only one race, and what's that? Human. It's the human race. Yeah, the human race. Uh, but yeah, that is interesting, isn't it? Interesting to do that. Well, we'll, we'll do some more of that. The, the thing uh, that nobody got right, unfortunately, to get the prize, is the best, the world's best ice cream is, uh, and this is somewhat subjective, but studies have shown um, that the best ice cream is Jamocha Almond Fudge from Baskin Robbins. And I used to be addicted to those things when I was under a lot of stress, having been fired from a couple of jobs. And um, I used to stop two or three days a week, it seems, and get my little Jamocha almond fudge. And, and my uh, father-in-law at the time taught me how to do this. And what you do is you, you go in and you order a vanilla shake made with Jamocha almond fudge ice cream. And the vanilla, vanilla and milk, and uh, the vanilla enhances the flavor of what you're getting. And, and this will be on the test, the way you're looking at me. And... Uh, and so what's good about a, a Jamocha almond fudge shake is it's so rich and full of fat and sugar and things you can't eat a lot of now. But at the bottom, all the almonds fall. And so you can rationalize that it's health food, which is compensating for the, the bad food you just drunk. So you, you get to the bottom and you chew the nuts and you kind of somehow feel like you've had a health food shake. <laughs> is anybody buying this? No. So... Um, so it was sort of like a payoff at the end. And so one day I was driving away, and I was got a few blocks away, and I was finishing drinking it. I can't believe I'm doing this on TV. But I got to the to a piece of almond, and I kept chewing, and it wasn't chewing up. <laughs> I was just chewing away, and it was like remaining uh, in my mouth and not chewing up like it would. And so I, I, uh, I pulled out, and it, I promise, it was a little baby Band-Aid that had fought. <laughs> That it, <laughs> that it, <laughs> that the scooper had dropped. It was once I sucked the pad, I threw it out the window. It was the grossest. It was the grossest experience I've ever had. Um, <laughs> Y'all are terrible. Okay, one of my favorite writers is uh, has, uh, poets for years is James Cavanaugh. James Cavanaugh who was a Catholic priest for years and then became a psychologist and now he's a poet and writer and uh, I've, sh I've shared this in my other classes and I think it's, it's so good but it particularly applies, applies to this class. And what I want to do is read this poem and then have the three come up and do our um, presentation for the day and then I have some stuff to teach you that we can use for an exam question that will be very interesting. Here's what he said. He says, the only sanity left is madness. Madness enough to resist all that is respectable and decent. I stand among the luau's, excuse me, I stand among the lonely at their luau's and cocktails. I hear stories I've heard before and I study strong men's faces and see the dullness in their eyes. I endure the silent pain of docile, obedient wives. I watch niceness replace passion and fear give birth to sterile kindness. What is there left to be proud of? A yard without weeds? A car without scratches? What remains to boast of? Money in the bank? A computer that will finally tell you how to live? Sometimes I wish life were a deck of cards, deck of cards, 
that had to be reshuffled every few years. Whites would be married to blacks. Salesmen would be nuclear physicists. Astronauts would become chimney sweeps. And twin chimney sweeps would be surgeons. Poets would be bartenders. And lawyers, poets. Skinny women would be fat. And fat women, men. Old men. Old, old men would be boys. And young women would be frightened matrons. All at the turn of a card, the shuffle of a deck. And then life would be wild and crazy and alive once again. So as I look at, at you and as I look at cultural diversity, what I see is something that is live and wild and full of life because we all tend to keep the deck so neatly stacked, our lives so orderly. And every now and then, to get the deck shuffled, it makes life much more passionate. Um, okay, uh, so let's have our presentation today on the three of them, and let's see who's coming up. Uh, Kareem, Josh, and Adil. Let's give them a hand. They've come a long way. Long way to be here. Stars of screen and television. And uh, we don't need to put this on. This is already on. And you are... No, Josh, no. You're Kareem. Yeah, yeah Kareem. How y'all doing? Fine. Fine. All right, the article I'm going to talk about is the first article. It's called Culture, Not Race, Explains Human Diversity. Basically, this article starts out pointing out that there's no way to predict a person's physical or psychological trait by their race. The whole theme of this article is to inform us that we are the way we are, we act the way we do because of our culture and not by our race. What I learned from society, it's just my perception, what I learned from society is that almost everyone is either a racist or prejudiced to someone or something. The reason behind all this that I say this is because perception is truth for a lot of us. And I just want to start asking a question. How many of us have been judged, either walked into a store and a cashier just looked at us a little harder thinking we were going to steal? Or some of us been perceived as being a bad person. Cop might look at, look at you a little harder. For the girls, some of us girls been judged as being conceited, fast. Everybody's been judged. You want to get a show of hands for that? Yeah, we can get a show of hands. That would be interesting. How, how many have, have felt like they've been singled out because of their race or culture or something? And what is that, half the class? A uh, third of the class? See, we're kind of just giving feedback for the guy on TV. It's a great question. Okay. Great question. So a lot of us says we've been judged, and did this, did this make you feel good, or did it offend you? Someone made you feel bad? Well, it made me feel kind of bad. Uh, I was at the airport. It was like uh, December of 01. And I had grown out my beard. I was lazy. And so they were doing random searches. And the guy just yanked me out of the whole crowd because he thought I was, I don't know, I looked like a terrorist or something. So he thought I was bad or something. So he unzipped all my baggage and threw out everything. And he was like, OK, you can put it back in now. He didn't even help me do anything. So that felt kind of bad. Well, sorry for that. But, uh -huh. All of us have been judged but by a show of hands. Who can honestly say that, have, have we judged somebody? Have we perceived somebody as being somebody? Everybody has. <laughs> okay. So this basically, it talks about culture. Culture basically structures our behavior, thoughts, and even our perception. Now, all this is done subconsciously. How many of us speak Spanish, for instance? Okay. And... How did you learn Spanish? Was it did someone teach you? Uh, my parents are Puerto Rican, and they totally uh, made us speak Spanish in the home while we were children, so just to make natural, sure that we didn't forget. Just, yeah. Okay. Now, how many of us take Spanish in class, like in college, that's not don't speak Spanish? How do you think of it? Is it hard? It's very hard. It's very hard. Okay. 
Now, the point I'm just trying to bring up is that this man speaks Spanish, and the reason it's easy for him, it's natural for him, because he was taught. It was all subconsciously. He didn't try to consciously learn it. This man who's trying to take Spanish and trying to learn it, it's like it's another different language for him, and it's just very difficult. And this has to do with culture. I mean, we grow up, and we see the things we do, and that's how we pick up who we are, the different values we have, and whether we know it or not, the people we hang with has uh, affects how we act, and it's not even on purpose, but everything's more done subconsciously, just like a language is taught, learned subconsciously. This brings me to the next thing, cultural relativism. Uh -huh. This is uh, the meaning of this is basically instead of using our perception to judge somebody, we should instead look carefully at what other people are doing and try to understand their behavior in context before we judge them. In short, this means don't judge somebody till you're in their shoes. And this brings me to another thing. Last Sunday, I don't know if some of y'all saw it, but I, I was watching TV and a Martin Luther King movie came on. And the part I saw was he was in a church and he was preaching in a church and he was preaching about the civil rights and all the movements. And it was a white man. It was all black, but it was one white man in the church. And the minute he brought this point up, he came to the front of the church and just hit, hit Martin Luther King. Wow. So then everybody got mad and they wanted to do violence to this dude, but Martin Luther King, he stopped everybody and he just said, instead of hating this man like he hates us, we should try to understand him because he's sticking up for him saying it wasn't his fault that the way he is. We should try to understand that his parents taught him to be racist, so his society taught him to be racist, so I mean, he tried to understand, he, he just tried to understand why this man is the way he is. Instead of judging him, he's trying to really understand and come to a conclusion of why he acts the way he acts. And, I mean, a lot of us, we know the right things to do, we know the right things to say, but, I mean, it's a lot easier said than done. And I just admired, that, admired him that in that adversity, in that rage, because it's hard to think in rage, that he was able to just stay calm and put his point out there. Okay. Uh, I know it's going to be a sensitive subject, but it's, uh, I'm talking about culture, and I don't think I can talk about culture without bringing up religion. So, I just want to know, can we all agree that religion is one of the most valuable beliefs we have as an individual? We can agree to that. It's one of the strongest things we believe in. It's our religion. How many of us is a Christian, by show of hands? Christian. How many of us Catholic? That'd be Christian too, wouldn't it? <laughs> How many of us are Muslims? How many of us are other religion? Okay. Any atheists? Any atheists? Atheist. Yeah, good. Okay. A lot of people turn to atheists these days. <laughs> but, uh... Now, I'm sure all of us strongly believe in our religion, but I just want to ask somebody, I mean, if you don't want to answer, but... I just want to know how how does your religion feel on another religion? Perceive another religion. That's, I have someone from a Christian side. I think <clears throat> raise their hands. I, I just feel that uh, there's a God. And all the religion is just motion people go through. You know, it's something they brought up in their culture, so that's what they've been taught to go to. But really, I don't buy into all the religion. I, I feel religion is dead, but God is not dead. There's a God. So. Mm -hmm. What is up? Because I visited a Catholic church, and I went to a Catholic church, and the preacher basically said that if you want Catholic, you're going to hell. So that offended me, because I'm a Baptist. So, And then I have Muslim people, they come up to me, and they tell me to convert, or I'm going to hell. And then we have Christian people who tell Muslims to convert, or they're going to hell. And I, my point is that... Hell's going to be a big crowded place, isn't it? <laughs> If, if, we're going, if we're going by people's religion, then one person is right, and there's so many religions. So if we're going by everybody's religion, saying there's one God and one belief, then I mean, somebody's taking the odds out of somebody. A lot of people are going to be wrong. And Do you have another question? And so, so we keep moving on. You're doing a great job. Just keep on moving. Well, I just want to leave off saying that uh, mostly uh, 
I just want to think about because we have our religion. I just want to think of people to understand that what people would think if you were born into another religion, do you think you would still like if you were born a Muslim and you believe in Muslim now? What if you were born Christian? Do you think you would go to Muslim or you would stay Christian? It does seem and, to be related to culture, doesn't it? And birth and family and yes. at least until you get older, then when you might decide something else. But anyway, good job. Let's give him a hand, Kareem. First guy out there, Josh. Hello, everybody, and all the TV viewers. <laughs> He's a star, man. Star, natural born star. All right, I'm gonna discuss with y'all the article that deals with um, the theoretical con concepts concerning ethnocentrism. And first, you need to know what ethnocentrism is. So I'll go ahead and say what the book says, and that's when uh people come into contact with other cultures that differ from theirs and you just automatically without thinking we're always making judgments looking at people and uh, you use your culture as a standard to judge theirs and the book asks how, how must we deal with it and we have to deal with it because we live around a diverse group of people and I feel that really it's something that's taught because behavior is learned it's not inherited and I feel that as parents to our kids, like for example that, that show we watched the other day with all the children, see they didn't see color, they saw a friend. Mm -hmm. So I feel that parents should teach the children to to understand that everyone's different but not necessarily better or worse due to the color of their skin. So uh, maybe you could solve part of that problem by teaching our kids not to be uh, the way we are. Right. You know? right. And then uh, something else that came to my attention the, the article started to talk about uh, why people feel this way. You know, they take pride in the color of their skin and all, all sorts of things like that. And to me, that seems kind of foolish because to me, taking pride in something is something that you've worked to achieve or accomplish. But like you said, you know, you, you can't help what color you come out. That's just, that's just the way it is. So, you know, all those people back in the 60s, you know, white power, white pride, and Vice versa just seem kind of foolish to me, you know. We should just learn from the past, basically. And then the article also went on to describe uh, individualism versus collectivism. And I just want to know, as a class, feel uh, what do you think America is? Think it's more individualistic or more collective? Individualistic. Why? Well, might ask the group what they feel. How many feel like they're individualistic versus? I mean, yeah. That. <laughs> uh, go ahead and ask him. We'll see I mean, him raise it. Raise how it. many of y'all in here believe that you're individualist? Or individualistic? Okay. Yeah. Probably about half and half. Mm -hmm. And, and the collective. Other. And does that have to do with? How many know? are more collective? Feel like they're more collective and involved in groups and committed to groups and. Yeah. And see, the the book says that most of the Eastern cultures tend to be more collective. So I, I can see that by the raise of hands. So I guess it's true. But the reason for that, I don't know, what do you think the reason for that is? You think it's the way they were brought up? They, some of the Eastern cultures might be a little more masculine, you know, getting the job done. They're real regimented, militaristic. For Japan, for example, as compared to the U.S., we're just kind of like lackadaisical. We, don't, we have a bigger tolerance for things around here. If you did some of the things we do over here in another country, they would shoot you. <laughs> and they do. Yeah. <laughs> they do. Singapore, I mean, if you spit gum on the sidewalk, and chop your hand off or something. I don't know. It's crazy. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, most cultures tend to see Americans as abrasive, and I was wondering, do y'all have any opinions on that? Why do you think that is? Well, I think that... Uh, this time. I think that because America has so much resources, it's so vast, that's probably one reason that like we can be more individualistic here. That's kind of in reference to something else you were saying. But also, I don't know about that. I think like what you just said is that people are more harsh in other countries and that if you do something small and fraction can get you, you know, a whole lot you know, get get you in a whole lot more trouble, which seems pretty harsh. So it seems seems like uh I don't know, some, some Americans that live in big cities are probably jaded, but I mean, that's probably the way it is in every big city, in like mm. Mexico City. So, no, I don't really think that Americans are m any more harsh than anybody else. She has a comment right here. 
Um, I think a lot of the reason why um, the, the, the Americans or the Western um, mm. culture seems to be more individualistic is also it has a lot to do with the history of the way the country was founded. Like we, we as the nation, we like you know, we overcame the British and we, you know, we we exerted our own efforts and we like achieved something. Um, but a lot of the times, the Eastern cultures are very tradition-based. I mean, uh, things have been passed down from generation to generation, whereas this country is, is, is very new well, and up and coming. And um, so I think that's where a lot of the difference comes from. That's down. true. That's a good point. You I think, think also, just because we go to different countries and we're kind of just like doing our own thing. Like we don't, when we travel, we don't really try to experience their culture. We want to just bring our culture and do our own thing I'm in their country. And that's way. disrespectful because when you go somewhere, you have to embrace their kind of culture. Like people will go over to France. A lot of people visit Paris and they think, that everyone will just speak English for them because they're the tourists and they're the money. But that's rude to just go over to somebody's country and expect them just to speak your language because you're there. And so I think we give ourselves a bad name by the way we act when we go and travel other places. Do you think that's maybe part of the reason there's misunderstandings with cultures? Maybe why they look down on us? Just because probably we come from two different places and, you know, the best way to deal with that is to put yourself in the other person's shoes. Or at least that's how I feel. So maybe that's where some of the misunderstandings come from. And then the last thing I wanted to ask y'all, um, let's see. Do y'all do y'all feel that we're more masculine orientated than a feministic culture? Like, okay, for example, masculine cultures, ex they uh, emphasize getting the job done. They're regimented. They're kind of like, they worry about time more, you know, everyone's in a hurry. They don't stop stop to smell the flowers, as per se, a feministic culture would. Like I feel that's more Eastern, you know, they're they're family oriented and traditional and we have a tendency to break away from those ties here in America just because it's a big melting, there's a lot of diversity here. So maybe, you know, that's where some of the misunderstandings come from as well. I didn't have anything else to say to Good you. Have job. Great job. Just give him a hand, y'all. Thank you. time I stand up, the microphone comes off. That's a great job. A lot of this stuff y'all covered, which is a wonderful job starting out with. You know, I'm, re I'm really not looking, uh, just want y'all to cover the material from the article and just share it, and, and you'll, as I'll sort of monitor the time. I didn't mean to cut in on y'all's stuff, because I know you put stuff together, but uh, that's just great, you know. Share what the article says and your feelings and ask some questions, get a little interaction. Um, from that, and, and we're, we'll have a session uh, uh, in, several more classes uh, you know down the road where we'll talk about different religions we'll also look at uh, I have a handout on different uh, cultures like feminine and masculine and uh, those issues and how that affect uh, that this article sort of starts out with um, okay and uh, for those who are on for um, Tuesday's class after class uh, the, the three of y'all that are on will meet up here so you'll know um, where to uh, where to get together. There are uh, three. I'll be right back. <laughs> three uh, basic approaches or techniques for survival and coping with life. They're actually, see, if, I'm going to see if I can do this and uh, see if we can make this happen right here. <clears throat> there are three. Um, what did I call them? Approaches. for uh, survival and coping. And these are, these are just general basic psychology. We've gone off the air. Have, Stacy, do you have this? Or do we need to turn it on? Ah, there I am. Okay. I need to pull it down. Aha! There it is. Okay. And these are basically um, a term we'll learn in here because this is psychology. I should put three uh, ego stances. 
We're not born into the world with an ego. We, we begin to shape and form an ego. The ego is simply, don't be afraid of that word. Some people think it's what you have as a breakfast waffle. That's actually an ego. But uh, an, an ego is a basic... Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's the Greek word for I or me. And it's the center of your decision making. It's the center of your... Uh, uh, conscious personality and everybody in this room has a good ego because if you didn't you wouldn't have gotten up got dressed most of you look clean and, and, and dressed and you drove on the correct side of the street and you knew how to get here you knew how to make some important life decisions uh, I spent six and a half years working at a mental health center here in, in Midtown Houston I had 70 schizophrenics on my caseload um, and many of these people uh, were what we call them street people now. This was pre-Reagan years when we had a lot more money uh, before these uh, street people and housing for them. And many of these people mentally ill and they would come in to get their medication and, and many of them had very poor ego structures. The, the ability to make decisions, to, uh, the ego is the center of your willpower and uh, this is the ego is basically formed the first 14 years of life. We're going to look more at this uh, in the classes to come. And you can be grateful that you were born into parents who fed you, clothed you, or caregivers uh, that got your basic needs satiated. They changed you, they held you, they kept you warm. Uh, remember, half the world lives on less than $2 a day. And I heard a figure one time that there are 20 million women every night that leave junkyards scourging for food for them and their families. And this is, of course, something in our affluent world. I mean, my, we're among the very privileged to be in a college environment. And, um, uh, you know, to, to grow up and not get the right nourish, nourishment and the right food has tremendous effect on your brain development. I mean, biology, just simple biology. And, uh, and then to get your basic needs. You know, when you cried, somebody showed up. For every one of us in this room, even if you were in a neglectful, abusive home, in those first 18 months, two years, three years, somebody attended to your needs. And, and this is uh, kind of interesting. You really won't appreciate that. And this isn't one of those lectures, you know, when you get to be older, but it kind of is. Until you sort of wipe some butts and noses of your kids. And you'll go, my gosh, these, my parents did this for me? <laughs> you know, the average kid, you know, wets their, dirties their diapers 12 to 14 times a day. And somebody did that. Somebody was there for you when you were extremely dependent and needy and could not function without some caregivers. And, uh, uh, and we all got that in this room, we did, because we wouldn't be functioning at a, an ego level to, to, uh, to, to be able to cope and function and survive this way. And uh, uh, this is uh, uh, three ways that we do this. The first one, three ways we live through life for stances. And the first one, of course, is inflation. Of course, like you know it. <laughs> uh, the first one is inflation. It's to live inflated. And, um, and uh, it's to live with a sense of uh, uh, pride, pretentiousness. It's to be what we call, inflation is to be ego-centered. It's to be full of pride, uh, puffed up. It's really a, a, comp, a compensation for a feeling of inferiority, but it's to be inflated is a, is a common uh, theme that, uh, that not only individuals but cultures take. It's to be self-centered. And although the United States has been one of the, by, by far and away, one of the most compassionate cultures in all the world in terms of its giving and supporting the needs of the world, immediately when, when the earthquake hit BAM, there were dozens of United States-based organizations to help surviving victims and the government. And we were at a very tense place with, the, with Iran. And yet, immediately, they received aid and doctors and help and... Uh, you know, dogs to go in and look for people. Uh, but, but, but in spite of that, we see a lot of uh, individuality often, individualism often causes egocentricity. Are you with me? 
But to live inflation is, is uh, me first. Um, to live that way is, is an approach to life, and it's very common. And it's often seen uh, that, the, that the, uh, the Declaration of Independence for uh, his final words was life, liberty, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we've all take on the spirit of entitlement that I have a right to get whatever I want and get out of the way. And see, my Constitution says that. I wish he would have said life, liberty, and the pursuit of meaning. The pursuit of a meaningful life. The pursuit of purpose. The pursuit of a life that counts. But when he throws out the word happy, it almost gives us all permission to remain pre-adolescents, kicking and screaming and demanding, I want what I want when I want it. See, we have the Declaration of Independence that gives me that right. Uh, but th this, a lot of this feeds our inflation. And inflation, all of this, these are not bad things. You, if you didn't feel inflated about yourself and feel good about yourself, you couldn't get up in the morning. You wouldn't take risk. You have to have a good sense of... You get our positive self-esteem from a sense of inflation. But inflation alone, to be ego-centered, self-centered, it's to be in love with my own images. Um, it's to... Um, Love my images of life. I mean, my imaginations. To love my ways. See. The three great religions of our land, uh, I've heard uh, other psychologists talk about, are the three great isms, are um, materialism, and... Uh, What's the root word of madre, matter? What is that, the root word, material? What is it? Yeah, what, yeah, what is maternalism? What does that root word, mater, mean? Mother. Say it again. Mother. mother, yeah, it's mother. So we learn to nurture ourselves by using things. Got a new car. Got some new clothes. Wow, when I buy these new things, it makes me feel good. And of course it, keeps the economy moving and all the stuff there on TV is you can nurture yourself by getting a new house, buying a new stereo, getting a new CD, you know, and this in, in and of itself, there's nothing wrong with this. It's very human to get new and nice things, material things, but as a culture, we end up providing, uh, nurturing ourselves through things alone, and how many have discovered that things alone can't give you a fulfillment in life? If some of y'all know that, there's a classic story that I heard years ago from a, a, a young co-ed that went off to the University of Texas and she wrote her parents back a letter in, uh, somewhere in her first semester and she said, I just want to thank you for never decorating that embarrassing uh, bathroom downstairs that all of our guests used. This was a, back the ranch style in the 60s and 70s and it was one of these bathrooms that was purple and yellow tile and uh, and she wrote an, uh, somebody told me about this article she wrote. And it was basically, thank you for the ugly bathroom. Because every summer, when they're, every winter, they talk about what are we going to do in the summer. And the choice was, do we want to get that bathroom fixed up so that it looks decent and modern? Or do we want to go ahead and take our family vacation? And year after year, they all decided, let's do the vacation. And leave it looking like it was. And so now if it's school that uh, material thing, she said, I, I have many friends I've met who grew up in immaculate, beautiful, better homes and gardens, bathrooms, but they never had any fun, and they never played, and their parents never took time for them, but they sure had a materially wonderful home. See how that works? So materialism, see there's the ism. Isms are our, can be our religions. And materialism is, uh, is using things alone uh, for nurturing. And see, I'm using the word nurturing as another word for mothering because the, the archetype uh, of probably the two greatest themes of life uh, on all of them is mother, father, energy, stuff like that, but nurturing. Another ism around this inflation issue it would be uh, hedonism. And what is hedonism? The pursuit of pleasure? Do what? Like just uh, doing things for pleasure? Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, seeking uh, pleasure alone. 
pleasure only in making all our decisions. And this is certainly, I'm not trying to spoil the party, because of course, do the things you enjoy and follow your bliss and seek those things. But do you know everything that feels good is not good, is it? Hello? Are y'all with me? <laughs> everything that feels good is not good, and everything that feels bad is equally not bad. So if, you, if you've lost a loved one and, it, 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 and, and have not cried but held it inside because you, you couldn't get in touch with your feelings, felt embarrassed to express them, and you didn't want to feel those bad feelings, well, let me tell you, the loss of someone who's very important to you to hurt is a good hurt. That's how you get over it. You only get over your losses through grieving them. See? Um, some of the greatest things we do in life are difficult. And if we, you know, getting a college degree, believe me, this won't all be pleasurable. Have you all experienced only pleasure in studies? No, a lot of it's a pain, and it's irrelevant, and it's no fun. But to seek pleasure alone, this is another ism, a religion of inflation, of uh, being preoccupied. You, you see, it's like rivers, someone said, a great metaphor, get crooked avoiding obstacles. And who would want to play in a golf course that had no trees, no water, no sand. I think it's called putt-putt. <laughs> uh, but but there's, there's a sense that the more difficult the golf course, uh, the more you have to learn the game. You have to learn to be a better golfer. So, so trying to avoid the pain and suffering of life is a great way to uh, remain pre-adolescent as a child. But these are the inflated personality that says, I want what I want when I want it, is a person who remains immature, dependent and highly unconscious. And the third one would be um, um, narcissism. And what is narcissism? Narcissa. Do what? In love with yourself. Yeah, it's being in love with yourself in, in the sense that uh, it's, uh, it's preoccupied with uh, yourself. See, the person who is narcissistically self-focused is one who doesn't have a relationship with their deeper world. And so what we do is use and abuse others uh, in order to give our life meaning. Uh, you know, the classic joke of the narcissist is, well, well enough of talking about me, now let's talk about what you think about me. <laughs> See? If you're ever in conversation with people, you'll find the rarest gift is listening. And, and when, when you're talking, when, when somebody's talking, you're thinking about what you want to say. And they say, oh, I had a horrible wreck the other day. You go, oh, wow, I had one about three uh, months ago. It was just terrible. It wrecked my car. And the person's lying there and they're bleeding or something. And you're going, oh, wow, yours is really bad. But, you know, mine was just ten times worse. And it was this and that. And suddenly, they're no longer sin of a stage because your, your own narcissism, we all have all of these things, has taken over. And it's all about you. See? And it, all of us have been around narcissistic uh, narcissism. We all have some of it. A, nar a narcissistic person is one who has no relationship with their inner world, their sadness, their joy. They're not able to be reflective. Watch this. The number one rule of relating, and this is so true for this class, is you have to be willing to see life from another person's point of view. You have to be willing to see life from another person's point of view. That's why I say, well, tell me where you're from. And when you start saying things about your background, suddenly in my mind, it springs with images like, wow, to see life from your point of view is the essence of all relatedness. To only relate it back to me is the height of inflation. And this is the way people go through life being so preoccupied with themselves, they never connect with anybody or anything and therefore don't learn. Um, and and that would be a good paper to write about Narcissus, the... Greek uh, story of Narcissus who gets lost and he kneels down at the pool to drink the water and of course what does he see? Yeah, he sees a reflection of himself. And, and actually, here's a good question. When you look in the mirror in the morning, does anyone look back? And if the answer is yes, then you have a relationship with your deeper soul. See, Then you know there's life that teems within that there's a sacred story, there's a, a heroic journey, there's a life to live. When you look in the mirror, does anyone look back? 
And of course, the narcissistic personality can't see into the depth of their own life and they don't have a clue that other people have a deep life and have a meaningful life. And that everybody's story is as important as all of our stories. Now let me say this. Of course there's a positive narcissism. I have a right to my nine uh, square feet on the planet. I'm here. I have a right to express myself, my talents, my creativity, to breathe the air, clean air, to drink the water, clean water. I have a right in a healthy way to have narcissism. There's a healthy hedonism, of course. You know, you don't have to go through life suffering and, and seeking suffering as a way of being a martyr, which is highly narcissistic. And of course, there's nothing more joyful at times than buying something new and enjoying the smell of new leather shoes. I love to stick my nose in my new boots. <laughs> Does anybody know what I'm talking about? This is a male thing, Texas thing, I'm sure. I love the smell of leather. Not, not after I've worn them, of course, before I've worn them. <laughs> so, so inflation would be a, um, would be a form of uh, an ego stance for survival and cooking. The second one, and uh, is this still coming out on the air? Stacy. Oh, yeah, there we go. Can you still see it? I'm going, oh, I have a monitor here. Sound effects, no extra charge for that. And this would be the opposite, which would be reductionism. And to be reduced to say, I, it's, it's actually deflation. And this is a common way people go through life. Uh, up here, inflation would be pride, puffed up. Another word would be pretentiousness. Pretentiousness is another word for that. Grandiosity is another word for that. Uh, uh, this, this tape is being made uh, a few days before the Super Bowl here in 19, uh, 2004. And uh, <laughs> I was actually at the other Super Bowl we had in Houston. But if you'll watch on the TV and everything, do you see the inflation, the grandiosity, the, the hero level that these guys who have done nothing, well, they've done a lot, but they don't want to say this, they may be watching. They're gifted, talented athletes. How did they get that? What? How did they get that initially? They were born with great ability. And then they worked hard. Because I tried to make it on a pro team, and I didn't make it. I was too fast. Uh, but, uh, but, but you see what I'm saying? They, they came, and where did they get their gift and talent of a good body and an agile... Uh, uh, coordination. Where did they get that? It was a gift. It came from their genetics. It was their, it was their lucky gene pool. Somehow they came. And then that's wonderful, but when the Super Bowl comes, you see the whole inflation of a city and, you know, these are private professional teams <laughs> run by very rich who? What color? Who owns the teams? White men. Yeah, interesting, isn't it? Um, I don't think there's a widow yet that owns one. There has been in the past. Uh, but anyway, you just see grandiosity is not in the level of individual, but it goes into races. How many know another race that appears to be inflated and think they're better than others? Raise your hand if you know of another race that pretends like they're better than other people. Yeah. Listen, I, I've been taking this, I've t taught this course enough. There's people in certain parts of Mexico that think they're better than other people in parts of Mexico. There's people in India who think they're better than the other people, and the other people think they're better. And we see it in football competition, don't we? The Aggies, the Longhorns, and all that can be full of nonsensical, uh, adolescent, puffed-up inflation, grandiosity. And a lot of competition comes out of that. And at one level, it's fun, it's interesting, but at another level, uh, it can be very wounding because nobody's better than anybody else. But there's races... In, our, in this American culture, uh, well, let's, let me do this. Reductionism is deflation, is uh, to shrivel before life, is to shrivel, that's an R. It's uh, to concentrate on your abiding uh, insignificance. Your own abiding insignificance. I really don't count. I don't 
count. This is deflation. Another one is, I'm a loser. See? The inflated person, if you can read any of this, it's kind of messy, is, I'm a winner. I'm the best. See? And, and to live reductionistically is... Uh, uh, W.A. Auden talks in one of his poems, he has a line that says, poor, miserable, interesting me. See, this, the reductionism is the poor me motif. Poor me. Uh, I'm no thing. I'm no thing, which is the word nothing. See? <laughs> That's what that comes from. I'm no thing. Everyone else is important, but not me. And see, all of us have experienced time where we felt deflated. My older brother was favored more than I was. See, uh, and as a kid growing up, uh, you know, uh, he, he ended up taking my father's business and going to work with my father. And I thought, wow, well, I'm the loser. I'm not important. I wasn't interested in what my brother was interested in. But in my family, what he was interested in, the, my parents liked and rewarded. And so he was inflated about that. See, and I felt deflated. And not important and reduced to nothing. Now, now all of us have all of these. Uh, inflation is uh, feeling good about yourself is what gets you moving and, and gets you taking risk and gets you, you know, doing things and bettering yourself. So it's not all bad. But too much inflation is a crazy way to live because it's all about self-centeredness. And the same thing with reductionism. To say, uh, to be to to say I don't count to shrivel before life. Well, and this is really heavy. Reductionism means, I love that sound. Reduction means, means uh, uh, take no risk. That's what reductionism is. See, reductionism is to reduce yourself, is to put yourself down, is to claim you're less than. Um, and... Um, and to take no risk is probably the greatest risk, isn't it? The fact is, you got about, you live here, say, 75 years, and of course we live longer than that, and 25 years of that, you're asleep. Why do I say that? Because if you sleep eight hours a night, that's a third of a day, so in 75 years, you're asleep 25 years. So you got 50 years of being awake. And then I know people who don't really wake up to life until their 30s and 40s. So they've wasted a couple of decades. So the question is, is what are you going to do with these 50 years you're awake? Are you going to say, I don't count. I'm nothing. I'm not important. God messed up when I was born. Uh, uh, Clarissa Estes talks about the misplaced zygote, which is a great theme. And that is that... Uh, the zygote is the sperm and the egg come together and they leave the fallopian tube and the zygote settles into the, uh, the wall of the uterus and all of us took that route. Hello. And uh, she says that many of us feel like a misplaced zygote, which means the stork, metaphorically, who brings the baby, missed the family you were supposed to be in by three blocks. <laughs> I talk to people all the time going, yeah, they never understood me and my family. I always felt like I needed to be with somebody else. <laughs> See? And to live out of that sense of I got the shaft and I got messed around is to live out of a sense of deflation. And, uh, and healthy living, the, the third one, of course, is, I uh, had a different way of wording it here. And the, the other way to live is a willingness. This is the third approach for survival and coping, is a willingness To grow through awareness. A willingness to grow through awareness. And that's what education is all about. It's to letting yourself find new images to not be, watch this, so inflated that you don't learn and grow. So inflated that you feel like, and if I can do a little bit of this, if you ever been around somebody who's inflated, you know, I'm pretty cool. I got it all together. You know, you people don't know what's going on. You watch people where they walk, you know. Hey, man, I'm, I'm doing good, you know. Wow. Yeah, I'm, I've got it. See? Somebody's inflated to be over, to not be so overinflated, but to not be so deflated. To find something in the middle 
that says I'm not better than anybody and I'm darn sure not worse than anybody. I'm somewhere in the middle. I have worth and value, but I have clay feet. I have dreams and hopes. Uh, I have a mind. I have things written within me, gifts and talents that want to be expressed. And I'm so grateful for that, but I'm also just as common as dirt. I'm just as ordinary as anybody that ever walked the earth. And whenever I pass a dead squirrel on the road or a dead dog or something that you see, I'm often reminded that I'm more kin to that dead animal than I want to give myself credit. Because in the blink of an eye, I can miss a light and somebody hit me and I can die. I mean, we're very, very thin line of our life. We're, we're, the animals don't have a cat named Shasta, which is the mascot of this school, which nobody knows. Uh, that I found, You do know that? Uh, I found Shasta when I, was, I jog and bike and spin cycle and stuff. But I was jogging at Memorial Park about three years ago in, this, in the cold. It was, a, a fir, it was a New Year's Day. And it was really freezing. I was all bundled up. I heard this meow, meow. And I looked up, and here's this white cat with orange spots down it, up in this tree. And some runner there uh, said, uh, well, my boyfriend's got a car, you know. So we went over, and we pulled, she pulled the limb down, and I coaxed this cat out. And uh, so I thought mystically that I was supposed to have this cat. And I was, had been looking for a cat. So Shasta came into my life. Shasta lives with instincts and appetite. Shasta is in heaven because I give Shasta the best food. I had him neutered, but he didn't like that very much. But um, he now meows with a lisp, as it were. But uh, I'll, I'll let that <laughs> go through the deal. But, he, uh, but Shasta, uh, Shasta lives with instincts and appetites and pretty much sleeps all day and bugs me all night until I put it out, <laughs> put him out in the cold. I have no idea where I'm going with this, but, but, uh, but, but, do what? You were wondering too, that's good. But, uh, but to be, but, but to be, but to be stuck in a rut, see, Shasta doesn't have any purpose except to kill a rat every now and then. Uh, and to live out of instincts and appetites is to live in that deflated place in life. But to take some risk and dream some dreams will move us up to another place. Uh, let me finish this on this willingness to grow. And uh, we'll look at it more next time. But let me say a few more things before we stop here. And this is uh, the, the, the willingness to grow through uh, awareness uh, is to letting yourself, um, by finding, finding new images... See, if you think about yourself 10 years from now like you think about yourself now, you have, stu you have been stuck in, in number one or number two. But to live in this mysterious, creative, wonderful place of saying, well, I don't know who I am. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm not overly inflated. And I'm certainly not overly deflated. But I want to live reframing my life. Uh, we're finding new images, a willingness to grow through awareness and, uh, and to change by finding new images and change uh, through understanding. Through understanding. I've kind of defined what education is. I've kind of defined what education is. See? That's what educare, the Greek word educare, where we get education, means to draw out. Isn't that neat? To draw out in you what's already been put in there. It's interesting in the word scholar in Greek, school. The word school, does anybody know what that word means? The Greek word scholar means leisure. Leisure. And the idea is in the uh, Plato's Academy of the Souls, it was called, is you could leisurely go pursue your interest and be exposed to the many different things in life and, and see what drawn out to you and what... What are you attracted to and what repulses you and what's interesting and strange about the world so that you might integrate more in your life and, and become truly yourself. Um, so these three things, three approaches for survival and coping. One is inflation, to be ego-centered, puffed up, prideful, and stuck in that. And three aspects of that are materialism, hedonism, and narcissism. And then to be stuck in uh, another form, approach to life, is being reduced to nothing. Another word for that is to be a wallflower, to be a nobody. 
And of course, there's much more for that. And then the third one is the willingness to grow and change, adapt, keep becoming. I'll finish this on the next class, and I have some uh, ways that, uh, that we grow in this third thing. Uh, I'll see you all next time uh, for the next tape. Thank you.